We'd like to welcome Congressman, Congresswoman, excuse me, uh, Doris Matsui, a member of the Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee. She is a leader on the bipartisan Connect for Health Act, which addresses a number of telehealth policies. Congresswoman, thank you for joining us. Bob? Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Congresswoman, for joining thank us you. this morning. Um, pleasure. You've, you've introduced bipartisan legislation mm -hmm. uh, on health care, which is hard uh, to do. Well. <laughs> uh, and it's with Bill Johnson yes. um, of Ohio. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that legislation would do and where it is in, in the Congress right now? Okay, um, Bill Johnson and I have been doing a lot of things together and actually in um, technology we seem to be able to work together really very well okay. with the other side um, on telehealth with Bill Johnson and also uh, with Brad Guthrie when I work on Spectrum. But what we're trying to do, uh, Bill and I, is essentially um, to actually move forward with um, ensuring that we can have more access to telehealth. And the way we're doing it is that we already passed a Medicare Advantage as far as being able to use telehealth there. What we're trying to do is really kind of attack the big one, which is Medicare fee-for-service, mm -hmm. which is difficult because uh, CMS, HHS believes that, you know, or CBO believes that it's going to more essential, it's going to be cost more essentially, use more services. But in fact, what we like to do is uh, give uh, the secretary sort of the, to waive certain restrictions so that they can de he can decide what type of services can be paid uh, mm -hmm. for a fee for service, uh, reimbursed rather, uh, and then let them decide uh, and let the actuary decide at that point. So we feel, in essence, because that is really the the big one to attack. And if we do that and move that forward, it really breaks open a lot of the reimbursement issues. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, do, what do you see in your, in your district? Uh, what are you hearing from your constituents? And we talk about acronyms of CBO and HHS. <laughs> and, and you know, what, what do you see at the ground level of telehealth and telemedicine that's actually you know, helping patients where technology is, is an asset? Well, you know, nowadays, um, technology is all around us. I mean, our personal lives, we use it all the time. And so I believe that, in essence, people want to see this more in healthcare mm -hmm. and make it more efficient. And certainly, that's one of the aspects of lowering the cost, too. And I believe it can be safe and secure and cost-saving, too, if, in fact, we allow patients uh, to in monitoring themselves, in essence, especially of chronic diseases like diabetes. Mm -hmm. And also, when you think about the fact that um, there are deficiencies in um, really reaching out to specialists or primary care doctors, and the barriers of, of ge geography and also of transportation, so why not allow uh, individuals to really do maybe video conferences, uh, be able to uh, do things electronically, so that the patients themselves feel like they have uh, um, the opportunity to access health care mm -hmm. efficiently and um, during the time that they can actually do it too because a lot of people cannot have in-person care. I mean that's just the way it is, particularly in rural areas and even urban areas where uh, particularly older folks can't get around as much. Sure. So I think for Medicare in particular and also we're looking at it in, um, in behavioral health. I think that is so important because there are some um, you know, behavioral health uh, uh, provider shortages, and in this way, you know, a person can, you know, contact their psychologist and be able to have um, a conversation or be able to be assisted in a way that is timely. And with uh, particular behavioral mental health, sometimes you need that right away. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult to get to your uh, health care provider, your mental health provider, and in this way, you can uh, assist a person uh, with their health care, mental health care, in a timely manner. What, what is the effect of uh, access to broadband? I mean, everybody kind of mm -hmm. in Washington and New York and the Northeast thinks, well, I just everyone has access to the Internet, but it's really <laughs> not the case. Yeah. Uh, how big a problem is that? I think it's a big problem. It really is because uh, we can't, we can have it even in urban areas. I mean, most people think in urban areas you have broadband. Not all the time is that true because they're, there are underserved areas in the urban areas, but particularly in rural areas, mm -hmm. 
it's difficult to have broadband out there. Uh, carriers don't want to be there. It doesn't, you know, it's costly. Right. So that's where we have to incentivize um, the carriers to be out there, in essence. And so that's where we look at wireless and things like that. And so the, the rural areas are really uh, areas where we really believe uh, broadband is going to be necessary for them to not only have the health care they need and deserve, but for economic development also. You're a member of the Energy and Commerce Telehealth Working Group. Uh, oh, yes. What, what are the priorities of that group, uh, uh, and how often do you meet, et cetera, et cetera? It's a group that uh, was put together by uh, Chairman Upton when he was chairman. Mm -hmm. And it's a group of us who really look at these issues of health and technology and try to move bills forward. And we've been very successful, too, to do that and opening up the discussion in many cases, too, uh, because there are privacy aspects here that people are concerned about, and we do have to deal with that with cybersecurity because we have to look at what we do as far as making sure the platform in uh, healthcare works for this, and especially when we're talking about uh, electronic health records, mm -hmm. which are necessary. And that's one of the things we're incentivizing to, to a great degree. Uh, we have a piece of it in the um, opioids bill, which should be coming up this week, in which we're incentivizing um, uh, behavioral health uh, providers to use and adopt by using some incentive payments, just as we did with um, with hospitals and doctors, uh, and left them out as far as behavioral health. This was some time ago, though, with the High Tech Act. So it's really concerning to all of us, uh, particularly now, um, that we have really addressed more thoroughly and hopefully more carefully um, mental health care mm -hmm. uh, as being on parity with physical health. Uh, in 2017, according to a recent study, 71% of healthcare providers use some type of telemedicine mm -hmm. tool, uh, which is pretty good, but, but how can that number get higher? It needs to get higher. I think the problem is a lot of, um, it's, there are problems, I think, in communicating, too. We have different systems, and right. they're working through that. But also, I think people are sort of concerned about privacy aspects. And um, I think that has to be resolved. We'd like to see something take place in HHS uh, and have definitely some security aspect. And you mean like a regulation or? No, I think really having, I used to, I had a bill that's introduced again where we really have somebody um, at the level of the of assistant secretary okay. being in charge of this. Because I believe that there's certain areas that people feel like it, that are siloed. And I really feel that we need to have an expert there who understands what is going on to assist um, the healthcare providers. How can um, CMS and stakeholders help the situation and, and provide more access mm -hmm. and work together in a way? Well, CMS has to be um, much more flexible. And I think they have been to a certain degree, too. And that's why we want to really uh, incentivize, have them incentivize, for instance, the behavioral health providers to really use and adopt uh, a lot of the electronic health records, which they aren't right now. So we'd like them to do that and to really uh, open it up so that it'd be easier to do it. Now, you can do this at a level where you can have demonstration projects. Mm -hmm. And I think those kinds of things are really uh, efficient and they really do prove something. And both Democrats and Republicans like that because you're looking at it to see if it proves out and then you can expand it. Is there um, a lot of, there, there a lot of news this week, um, <laughs> but actually the government is not going to have a shutdown. There's right. a bipartisan bill, a uh, mm -hmm. funding bill that passed and there's actually been a lot of bipartisanship on appropriations uh, right. this year. Um, on, on the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, what's the level of bipartisanship? Well, I think recently, particularly in opioids, mm -hmm. uh, because that affects every district in this country, there's been a lot of bipartisanship. I believe where you know, we were able to focus on the opioid crisis, what some of us would like to do is you know, expand it even further, particularly because um, a lot of the payment for you know, opioids, uh, at least in the sense of behavioral health, um, is through Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at Medicaid and know that that is a vehicle which a lot of these things are paid for. And so even though we are in agreement with the fact that we have to address the opioid crisis and we're doing things, it's still at the edges yet. 
we need to look at the whole uh, situation and move forward. But it is good that we're addressing it. And um, as I said, in technology, the technology subcommittee, we really do work um, very well together because it's more regional differences mm -hmm. than um, partisan differences. And many times I represent urban suburban area, so I work with my uh, rural area um, colleagues because you know I've got the population and they have got all of this surface area and land. And I like to assist them because you know I've got un underserved areas, they have unserved areas. And many times we can help each other when we work through some of these things because if we can get help for each, then we're both winning. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll open it up to uh, questions, so think of your questions. Uh, one of the big questions heading into uh, the crucial stretch here, about 40 days away, mm -hmm. midterms, uh, is the House going to flip to the, to the Democratic, <laughs> to, to your party? Do you think the House is, is going to, to flip this fall? Well, I'm not going to be a prognosticator. I would just say that, <laughs> I would just say that I'm quietly confident. Okay. But, <laughs> but, listen. You know, it's a long time. Forty days is a long time in politics, and so, you know, I we're just going to work every single day, um, each of us, and I'll leave it at that. Healthcare, though, uh, Democrats have been talking a lot this mm -hmm. election year about about healthcare. Two part question: Number one, uh, is it the biggest issue that you hear uh, in your district? And number two, should Democrats win, would that be a uh, number one, number two, number three, top three priority? All of us are hearing about health care in different ways, um, whether it's about pre-existing conditions, it's about premiums, it's about the fact that they finally feel like they have some health care and they don't want to lose it. And so it's a big issue. That and jobs, which we're addressing also. Uh, but yes, health care is something that we started out with the Affordable Care Act, and I was, I was on the committee at the time when he wrote that. Mm -hmm. And we knew that there were, you know, first get access and we had to lower the costs, mm -hmm. and we couldn't get all of that done. Um, so therefore, we're looking at the access part. I think it's we need to stabilize the marketplace. We know how to we knew how to do that, and we'll move forward on that if we take the house back, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that I believe the Republicans also understand too that health care is so very important. Um, so we have to move forward on that and addressing the cost of health care. And I think all of us understand it's too costly. So we ha are moving in the way of value over uh, quantity, uh, particularly in areas in the Medicare. And so people understand that it's much easier or better to look at the whole continuum of care. Mm -hmm. And we started moving in that direction with uh, accountable care organizations and medical homes. And looking forward to as we address the all of the, the ultimate aspects of of the costs over time and using technology, which we haven't used as well as we probably could, to use that to address some of the costs also and the convenience. And also, I think we get better health care that way too. Mm -hmm. We'll open up for, for questions in the last few minutes uh, uh, of this segment. Uh, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and identify yourself and uh, just wait for the microphone to get to you. Hi, Congresswoman. Hope all is well. Um, good morning. My name is Calvin Robinson from Williams and Jensen. My question for you is: Do you guys have any um, views on the on removing the restrictions of 1834M? Which one is that one? Uh, that one is for telehealth regulations, uh, basically focusing on uh, different things from or originating sites, health plans for Oh yes, areas. right. Mm -hmm. We're addressing that particular piece of it is being addressed in the opioids bill. As it does, as it is uh, part of the, the opioids bill as we move forward, and it really is um, right now just for the opioids. We'd like to expand it out further, and that's part of what we intend to do. Um, this is part of you know having some of this lifted by uh, the secretary of HHS and you know, waive some of these conditions, and so. We believe we're making progress in that area, and the originating sites and things like that are the first step. Other questions? How has it been uh, working with the Trump administration on health care? Um, 
Well, I haven't necessarily been working with the Trump administration on health care. <laughs> I have been working with my colleagues on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Right. And, um, you know, it's been interesting because there's been a lot of previously all that repeal and replace. Um, that never happened, really. Um, they did the repeal, but they never did replace, and that didn't pass anyway. So, you know, I think it's been quieter, so we have been focusing on the aspects that we can work together. And mm -hmm. I think that's really very important. Um, and understanding that there are aspects of it where, in fact, I mentioned Medicare and Medicaid. And when the opioid crisis came about, which is interesting because we, in my district, we had a crisis maybe a couple years ago addressing it. But it didn't come that way in the rest of the country. So it's partic particularly in the Northeast and the East. It started really taking hold. And so in your district, it didn't really hit? It did hit, years. but okay. it hit earlier. Okay. okay. And uh, a lot of us coming down from China through Mexico, but you know we were addressing it as quickly as we could. Mm -hmm. uh, not that we don't have a crisis or it's all gone. It's never gone. I mean, I think those are the kinds of things right. we, we really have to continually address. I mean, we know with healthcare, nothing's ever completely done. And, um, it's um, one of the things is that you never know what's going to come up next, whether it's that, it's Ebola, whatever. So therefore, I think it, particularly in energy and commerce, we did get involved in many, many things. And the aspects of what we're doing um, are really relevant to what's happening today, whatever it is. And because of that, we seem to be able, we had some problems with help, but because everybody had the same situation, we were able to work together and also make some uh, reforms, to start to make some reforms, in particular areas like Medicaid and Medicare, as you brought up. And um, hopefully we can use that to move forward. Because they're somewhat like, to a certain degree, some dem they're like demonstration projects on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned affordability and working with Republicans, and Republicans see that there, there are problems, as, as uh, the Senator and the Congressman Carter mentioned in our last panel. Um, do you think, whatever happens in the election, that there could be, let's say outside of opioids, let's say outside of Obamacare, because that's going to be difficult, that there could be some work on prescription drug pricing oh, or yeah. anything like that? You, no. you think there could be bipartisanship on that? I hope so, you know, because that's what comes up an awful lot, the cost of prescription drugs. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of costs are really particularly um, um, a problem. And so we're looking at prescription drug costs, particularly in Medicare. Mm -hmm. And we like to see, um, you know, Medicare use its leverage since it's got 40 million people sure. beneficiaries, uh, and they all use medications. So if we can use that as a bargaining power, I think it'd be great because I think everybody knows if when Medicare moves, the rest of it moves too. So. That's that's an issue that President Trump has mentioned at least on the campaign trail, mm -hmm. but critics say he hasn't done much. Well, well I haven't seen too much in that, you know, I mean, so we're really looking at it and trying to figure out. A lot of it is layered, too. You can't tell sometimes when one adjusts one way, you know, like can go down one way and then they pick up, you know, it's costly in another place. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's a complicated issue, but it's one of the top issues for all of us. What, what about uh, single payer? Would that be a, a top priority for a house? Democratic control chamber? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's more, you know, through some of the states. I mean, the way I look at it, I believe in universal health care. So how we get there is going to be maybe, um, we'll look at, see whether we want to have, Medi you know, buy into Medicare, Medicare for all. We're not there yet. I'm just re recall, even though we're talking, we're not talking about Affordable Care Act, at the very beginning, we had a public option, right? Mm -hmm. So we understand what steps we might want to take in order to get to, to universal care. But it is something that we're talking about, but we're not taking any action right now. Just on the overall issue of funding, is that something that, that healthcare needs more funding and would it be taxes? I mean, some people are saying some, the tax cuts need to be repealed. Some Democrats are saying that. Well, I think that it's, I think if you look at the whole system, there are places that we can reduce costs, right? Mm -hmm. And I think we have to look at that. I think we need to look at um, the marketplace and make some adjustments there. And I also believe that we need to ensure that Medicare and Medicaid are stable. Mm -hmm. I think that's really very important because that provides so much of the health care of our nation. But I'm not going to say right away we have to add money to the system. 
I mean, I think we, we need to balance this thing out because there is there are things in the system right now, like we're talking about prescription drugs, that we need to squeeze some uh, efficiencies out of right now. Well, thank you for joining us this morning. Please thank, thank you. the Congresswoman. Thank I'll you. hand it back to Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you.